This week, the Clarets go into the international break with a chance to rest and recover from a slight hammering at this pans of the European champions, but mainly to review on what's been quite an impressive opening four fixtures of this Premier League campaign. This is the Known and Ever podcast. Hello and welcome back. It's the No Name Never podcast. I am your host, Natalie Bromley, and joining me on the panel this week is our good friends, Richard and Tom. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening, Natalie. Good evening, Natalie. How are you? Yeah, we're good. Thanks. How are you? Hi, Tom. Um, we've had a week off, listeners, um, just because it's been the international break. And we had initially intended to um, record this last week and have this week off. But I bit of a comedy of errors transpired against us to get a recording out last week, which has actually ended up being quite a blessing in disguise because there probably wasn't a massive amount to talk about from the Liverpool game. Um, it was a masterclass. Um, we'll go on to talk about some of the incidents in the game. But actually, there seems to be quite a lot that's gone on off the pitch since that game. So it's given us a chance to really review where we are now and um, analyse the first four games of that season. So this week, we're going to... Look into the second half of the show by looking at um, the England situation, who got called up, who didn't get called up. Um, say farewell to one of the most popular midfielders to ever play at Turf Moor. And also assess a very odd situation with our new midfield player and his freak injury. So let's not waste any time and let's get on with the show. So... The last time that the senior Clarets pulled on a Burnley shirt was at home against the current European champions, Liverpool. Um, we always knew it was going to be a tough afternoon. Um, Any time you face City or Liverpool in this league at the moment, you know it's going to be very, very tough. Um, and actually, it did end up being um, a defeat, which is probably what everybody outside of the real clout and blue tinted glasses was expecting. That said, don't think the scoreline really reflected what happened on the pitch, um, but it was a 3-0 defeat and that leaves Burnley with four points out of 12 from the opening four fixtures and sitting around middle of the pack. So, Tom, let's go to you first. Um, I thought 3-0... Well, OK, let's be realistic here. Liverpool were very, very good, but I thought 3-0 flattered them a little bit. I actually think Burnley did pretty well. Uh, yeah, I think the, based on the first half an hour, I don't think you would have said it was. A, it would have been a 3-0 game. Uh, we, I think we were given as good as we got. I know Salah hit the post, did that save from Pope, but I don't think he was ever going to score with that. Uh, we had a couple of chances, that one we would near the start. So we were well in the game. And then those two free goals, the timing of them, so one after the other, the two mistakes, that hit is really hard. And I think after that, we didn't look like we were in the game at all. I think, especially the way they played second half, when they were coming forward on the counter attack, they were carving us apart at will. I think, to be honest, it could have ended up five or six at that point. Uh, perhaps if Salah had been a bit less greedy, it would have done. So I think probably, based on the first half an hour, 3-0 does seem like a harsh scoreline. But given the, given the way we responded to going two goals down and some of the space and the freedom that Liverpool had in the second half, I think probably... Uh, 3-0, we maybe even got away with one there. I think it, it could have been worse. Yeah, it's quite unusual for this Burnley side to put their heads down a little bit. And I think it must be incredibly difficult to play that ridiculous calibre of players. And when you've gone 2-0 down, you know, how, how do you find the mental strength as a professional athlete to even believe that you are going to be able to, to claw something back from that game? Um Richard, let's come to you. Tom's just mentioned then, obviously, that the first two goals that gave them that 2-0 that lead were bizarre goals and they were very freak incidents. Um, let's talk for the first one, um, because that was probably the weirdest out of the two, where it just clicked the, the shoulder of Chris Wood, completely blindsided Nick Pope and ended up, up going into the back of the net. Um, what was your take on the goal? Uh, it's difficult to, to have a particular take on it. I think it's just really unfortunate from our point of view. Obviously, Alexander, Alexander Arnold's got quality uh, when he when he's putting the balls into the box. Like you said, Natalie just brushed off his shoulder, and it's a difficult one for Paul. Could he have done better? Possibly, but I suppose when it takes a deflection, you're just not expecting the ball to go in. From the angle I was watching it, it didn't even look like it was going in. All of a sudden, it just seemed to dip. 
um, at the last minute. So I was just really frustrated when I thought we defended well for half an hour. They had a couple of little chances, but it was nullifying the threat. Um, and then for a goal to go in like that, yeah, it just kind of set the tone for us, really. And, you know, our heads went down from there, especially after the second goal, like Tom said. Yeah, it's quite an interesting um, point that, that you you picked up on there. I think looking at some of the chances that, that we had, do you think that there is, um, from, from where you were looking, Richard, a, a problem with that game in that I think the Liverpool defence did a particularly good job of completely neutralising wooden bombs in the game and we didn't really have an answer to that. So when a freak goal like that does go in, you, you're kind of looking around and thinking, well... How am I, how are we going to react to this? I think you mentioned about the Liverpool defence and when they've got Van Dijk in it, he's just an absolute colossus. I've never seen a centre-half as as good as him. Um, you know, Wooden Barnes are two strong physical strikers, especially the form Barnes has been in. And he just completely nullified the threat. He made Barnes and Wood just like little lads, really. Um, and like you said, from 2-0 down, we kind of knew against that defence, especially against Van Dijk, we was never going to get back into the game and other than the wood chance really I can't really remember us having a significant opportunity where we carved them open or anything like that. and even the second half when the game was going a bit stale we could just not quite get enough pressure on their goal uh, to maybe cause any sort of panic going into say the last 20 minutes. Yeah, I think that's a fair enough response but I, to be honest I'm not entirely worried about it. I think that there'll be much stronger teams than us and I don't mean that any disrespect to this Burnley side at all but there's going to be a lot of teams I would say pretty much 18 out of the 20 sides in the division will fall at the hands of City and Liverpool this season that those two just are in a ridiculous form um yeah like you say I, I would have preferred us to show a little bit of that fighting spirit that we usually have but I, as I said before, it must be very hard as a professional athlete to find that desire to win when you've gone behind in a game like that, facing those players. Tom, moving away from the first goal, which we're just going to chalk up as a bit of a freak one and not an awful lot you can do about it. The second one was a little bit difficult. Difficult? No, different. That's the one. Difficult and different, actually. We'll use both. Um, a Ben Mee error um, gifted the ball in a very dangerous spot and sides like Liverpool, when they are gifted an opportunity like that, will take those chances. Ben's got to be massively disappointed with that, surely. Yeah, he knows himself. He's, he's made a massive error there. He's a bit too casual with his passing, um, especially at that point of the game where you've just conceded one and you need to stay in. You you know realistically that Liverpool aren't going to give up a two a two goal lead against many teams, especially not us. Um, I think you probably saw there why. Uh, I know we're going to come on to speak about the England squad a bit later. I think you probably saw in that moment why Ben Mee isn't in that squad. Southgate's picking his centre halves based on not just defensive capability, but based on what they can do with the ball. And um, it's definitely not Ben Mee's strength, unfortunately. He's, he's a great centre half. He's great at tackling, throwing his head in, throwing a leg in. But with the ball at his feet, uh, yeah, he, he can be a bit of a liability, and he showed it there. I think partly we suffer that we don't really have someone in the midfield um, who comes and takes the ball off him, like Defoe used to do when he was when he was at his peak. Um, Cork and Westwood aren't the kind of players who will come and take it off his toe and spray it around. And sometimes he does suffer a bit for that. I think he perhaps missed Taylor as an outlet on his on his left as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's no no excusing what he did. And he'll know himself as well. It's a bad error. Um, and it's probably put the game to bed at that point. Uh, I'm not going to you know dig him out. It, it, it does happen. Uh, and I think... You were quite kind to Pope as well. I think for the first goal, he's he's made a bit of an error as well. So we know we know it's going to happen. Um, and to be fair, it's probably better to make mistakes in those kind of games that we haven't got much chance in anyway, rather than giving goals away against the likes of uh, of Brighton and teams like that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think if if teams have are going to have an off day, we are much better to do it against sides that we're probably still going to get beat if we play our absolute best. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that about Pope. Um, I, I left it to Richard because he summarised that. I felt the same thing when I kept looking at that free goal. I kept looking at Pope and thinking, am I being really harsh here? Just thinking he maybe needs to do a little bit better there. But I'm not a goalkeeper and I'm a football fan. I'm not a football player. So I'm always very cautious about making those 
evaluations when I don't know the technicalities of being a keeper or a professional footballer in any way, shape or form. Believe me, if I could be a lioness, I would. it would be my dream job. But sadly, I, I do not have the capabilities. Um, so I do wonder whether it was just one of those freak things where actually if the ball hadn't taken the deflection off Wood's shoulder, he would have been in the perfect place. So I, I, I'm not going to pass comment on that. Um, and I, Tom, I completely agree with you as well in that this is not the time or place to to have um, a pop at, at Ben Mee because, you know, they work so hard all the time and, and, and mistakes will happen. And I think sometimes the style of play we put on the pitch and some of the decisions that we make as a team do lend themselves to, to individual errors sometimes. We do play those fine margins, don't we? And sometimes it's going to pay off and sometimes it isn't. And actually, I was quite interested to see a lack of um, criticism for Ben Mee. There was obviously on social media, there was the, oh God, Ben, oh, what are you doing? But nobody really hung him out to dry, which I think is really pleasing to see that that the fans appreciate that that Ben it's just one of those things and he will get over it. Um, I don't really think there was anything else really to talk about during that game. It was for a 3 0 victory, it was a relatively uneventful game. Um, Richard, it left us at the end of that game with four points from a possible 12 from the first four games of, of the season. Now, given that we were drawn Southampton at home, Arsenal away, Wolves away, and Liverpool at home. I would argue that that's at worst, I think, one point, well, gag, no, do you know what? I think that we were probably looking at maybe three points from those opening four games. And actually, we're probably one point ahead where we could have been. We could have easily have lost away at Wolves. Where do you feel better, worse? Where would you grade us in terms of those points from those first opening games? Yeah, I think before the start of the season, four points would have been a really good return. Um, obviously, Wolves have got a fantastic home record and then playing Arsenal away, who are always very good at the Emirates and obviously Liverpool at home. And even Southampton's not, a, not an easy game. They, they finished the season well. We only drew with them um, at home last season because of a last-minute penalty. But at the same time, I'm disappointed. Not because I think we've played really well in the first three games of the season, especially away at Arsenal. I think we were unlucky to come uh, to come away with nothing. And I don't care what anybody says. You, you might say in hindsight it's a good point, but when you can see the 95th minute penalty when they've not had a shot on target and you end up drawing the game, especially when you've had so many good chances yourself, you know, that's a real disappointing one. So I'm actually disappointed that we've not got six or seven points. Um, and that's just a reflection of not not me being negative, being you know, myself being more positive in a way because I think we played so well in them opening games. I definitely agree with the performances. I've been massively encouraged by how we played for those first three fixtures. And I think we've mentioned this on previous podcasts that I'm not at all concerned with us being dragged into a, a relegation battle this season because we're starting to look like we're pulling away from the, the bottom half of the of the of the um, teams in that division. Um, Tom, how do you? Th One thing that does concern me about this, though, is if you do look at the league, it is incredibly tight, um, and not not that many teams you thought would be rock bottom are rock bottom. Um, I guess the only thing that's concerning me a little bit is that some of the teams who we expect to be uh, battling the drop all season are picking up some bonus points. Sheffield United coming from 2-0 down away at Chelsea being a perfect example. Um, Southampton getting a point at... Was it Southampton got a point at United? Um, it, there seems to be a, a real set of, 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 not freak results, but unexpected results. And a lot of this, for me, is down to this idea that the dominance of a top six is breaking away. Do you share that view or if not, how how do you feel the dynamics of the league are this season? I think the examples that you picked there were, were two really good ones. Sheffield United getting a point at Chelsea and Southampton making a draw with Man United. You had Palace winning at Old Trafford as well. I think they're the two really uh, the two teams that are really going backwards. Um, I don't think their choices of manager are particularly inspiring. I think they've probably got the job uh, based on their playing career rather than their managerial career. And I think you're starting to see that in some of the results. I think uh, I think the top four this season is going to be well, it's going to be Man City, Liverpool, and I think Tottenham and Arsenal will be the other two. Um, so I think that the fact that uh, Southampton and, and Sheffield United are getting points off those teams probably says as much about Man United and Chelsea as it does about uh, about Southampton and Sheffield United. 
Uh, so I wouldn't be too worried by those results. I think when we play Man United and Chelsea, we'll be giving them a good game as well. Um, uh, I'm very confident about that. You saw the way we played against Arsenal as well. I think Arsenal will be a cut above those two this year. So, um, yeah, in the wider context of the league, uh, I think you're right. I think it does show that there's a the top six, or particularly those two in the top six, are, are probably there to be got at this season. I think quite a lot of people were tipping before the start of the season that that Leicester were going to have a good uh, a good shout of making the top six, perhaps Wolves. <clears throat> excuse me, and even West Ham as well. Um, and the way they've started uh, suggests that was probably probably a good shout. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd say um, rather than look at those results with trepidation, we should look at them with a bit of hope and think, you know, we've got just as good a chance of, of taking points at Old Trafford and Stamford Bridge as those teams have. We've done it in the past. I think we've got a draw at Stamford Bridge and Old Trafford last season. So uh, if we can do it last season, there's no reason we can't do it this season. Um, and then I think the other thing you have to remember as well with Sheffield United and Norwich getting some some good results early in the season, we've seen that with ourselves before. Two thousand nine ten is the one that springs to mind. You know, I think after three games we were seventh or something. We'd beat Man United, and Everton back to back. Sometimes you come in with a lot of momentum, you get some kind fixtures that fall for you. I mean, Sheffield United have been rubbing their hands together. Their first home game being Crystal Palace, and probably the same for Norwich playing Newcastle first home game. But uh, it's a long season. It's a 38-game season. So the fact that they're on our coattails after four games when we've, as we've discussed, had some really difficult fixtures to start, uh, I, I wouldn't be too worried that, that come the end of the season they, they're still going to be there or thereabouts. Excellent. I like that strategy. Um, before we, we move on then, Tom, the next four fixtures, we have Brighton away. Norwich at home, Villa away and Everton at home. Very much those winnable bank of, 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 uh, of fixtures that you were just talking about there. We had a tough start and a lot of the, the teams around us who are maybe a little bit higher up have had um, more comfortable starts. Out of those, four, well, four games, 12 possible points, what do you realistically think we should expect to get from those fixtures? Uh, I think uh, seven points is probably realistic. I think you'd, you'd be hoping to beat Norwich at home. I think Everton is is a tough home game. Uh, if it's anything like the home game last season, then that's going to be a difficult fixture. Um, but you, you'd you'd like to think we could go away to Villa and away to Brighton and, and pick up some points there. So if you put me on the spot, I'd say we'd probably win on Saturday at Brighton, win at home to Norwich, a draw with Villa, and maybe lose to Everton. But seven points from those four would be a, a decent return. If we got more than that, I'd be delighted. Yeah, I agree. I think seven seven's probably the minimum we should expect from those. I'm going to go a little bit more positive and I'm going to say I think we can probably get nine from those. I'm going to say um, I'm going to say we're going to win away at Brighton, win at home against Norwich, lose away at Villa and actually I think we're going to beat Everton at home. But Everton are not a good side this season. Um, I'm not at all convinced with Silva. And I, I yes, I know you're all going to tweet me that I'm going to, that comment is going to come back to haunt me when we lose 6-0 at home to Everton. It's going to be disastrous, but I genuinely do. Um, Richard, before we move on, what's your thoughts from those ne- the next four games? What do you expect us to pick up? Um, I'm more similar to what Tom would say. I think nine points, three out of four is quite difficult. You know, two away games. I think Everton are slightly better from what you're saying. I watched them against Wolves and they've got some good players. Um, so, yeah, I think seven points is reasonable. We always do... No well against Brighton. I thought we played really well last year when we won uh, 3-1. So I'm confident going into that game. Norwich at home, yeah, quite fancy us, you know, to you know to beat Norwich and Villa away, yeah, maybe a point. And I I probably have to rep- replicate Tom. So maybe you know six six seven eight points around that. I think getting nine points, winning three out of the four games, might be you know might be a little bit too difficult. Excellent. Well, I want it putting on record that you two went seven and I said nine. We're going to do it. Um, yeah, I think I think that's probably um, a, a fair reflection of where we are at the moment. It looks from these opening fixtures already that the, the title is going to be a straight shootout between City and Liverpool. And, and quite frankly, um, it's going to be um, all up for grabs for the rest of the league. I've actually got a really sneaky suspicion that Leicester will um, sneak into the top six this season. I'm not quite sure yet who they're going to replace. I think it's going to be either United or Chelsea, it looks like, that, that would fall if, if Leicester do do it. Um, Chelsea have got themselves in a very difficult position appointing Lampard and declaring that they're going to give him all the time in the world because if he doesn't start getting some results soon, I think the pressure is going to be really on. Um, but let, let us know what you think, how... 
you know how to get in touch with us, tweet us at known and ever or email us at podcast at known and ever net and let us know how you feel the first four games of the season's been. <laughs> So second half of this week's show, we're going to move away from the pitch and have a look off the pitch. And we're going to do a little bit of a player profile. Um, there's been lots going on um, with personnel. And I'm going to start this week, as as Tom mentioned earlier on, with the international call-up and more specifically the England squad. I think there had been real momentum in the press about a certain was Austrian now eligible for England in form, ruthless Premier League striker, that is Ashley Barnes, actually being called up for England. And we know how much time Southgate spends at Turf Moor. The news wasn't what we expected, though, and um, Ashley Barnes got left out. Now, there was um, quite a lot of, um, not anger, but certainly very forceful opinion on social media, as it tends to be. Um, Richard, we'll start with you. Um, I found it absolutely hilarious that, did you see Charlie Austin's Twitter rant that he went on when Barnes wasn't selected for the game? Yeah, I think it was interesting from Austin. Maybe that's a little bit of his own of his own selfishness because uh, he's possibly not been called up before when he's been when he's been banging in the goals. Would it have been brilliant if he got called up? Yeah, of course it would have been. It would have been amazing to see Barnes in an England shirt rustling the players up that he's playing against. Um, and I've just seen that we've gone 1-0 behind to Kosovo, so we maybe could have done with him on the pitch uh, to try and get a goal back. But I think the way Southgate's playing, uh, he's got a particular style, he's got a particular way of playing, he wants more younger players coming through and you've got to respect that. Do I think he's good enough for England? My heart says it'd be great to see, uh, to, great to see him play, but my head says no. So I just don't think technically uh, he's quite good enough to make it at the, at the top level. Yeah, it's quite interesting what you were saying there about um, justification for it. And, and certainly Charlie Austin, perhaps knowing full well how that feels to be overlooked when you've been banging the goals in. Um, Tom, it was quite interesting, really, because um, some of the official comments very much pick up on what Richard was talking about there. Now, um, Stuart Pearce has actually come out in the press today and said that he thought it was a mistake that Southgate left him out. And he said that if you are good enough, you will get in under Gareth Southgate, regardless of how old you are. Um, and he fully expects that he probably left him out because these ones were European qualifiers. And the next time it's a friendly session, he will get a nod. Um, but looking at the actual official response from Gareth Southgate as to why he left Ashley Barnes out, you can't help but think there's some real shade in here. So I'll just picking up on some of the things that he said. He said that he, you, he was struggling to, you, you can't overlook the numbers and how well he has started this season. However, <laughs> this is brilliant. Ashley Barnes is more of a second striker who just feeds off wood. England don't play the way Burnley play, and at Burnley, Dyche gets uh, sorry, Barnes gets a very different type of service. Also, Barnes is 29, and we are under pressure to stop holding Sancho back, and we've also got to compete against Rashford, Sterling, and Kane. As such, we just couldn't include him. Now, Tom, there's some valid points in there, but there's also a significant amount of shade in that response, don't you think? I don't think there's anyone who's suggesting that Barnes should be playing as a nippy winger ahead of uh, Sancho or Sterling. That's the first uh, thing that jumps out of you, isn't it? <laughs> exactly! <laughs> Very odd. I mean, uh, too much. <laughs> yeah, the, the idea that we'd be picking Barnes to uh, to to go outside the fullback and whip balls in ahead of Jaden Sancho is a bit of a strange one. I think uh, I think we talked a bit about it last time I was on, and and I think the position that I picked out really was centre forward, and that's where you'd be playing him. Surely you wouldn't be out, you wouldn't be wide in a three. You'd be he'd be playing on his own up front, and you think he can do that job. I mean, obviously he's not going to get in the team ahead of Kane, but it's it's who plays behind Kane and Rashford. When he's picked him, he's played wide for England. He looks better playing wide for England. He, he's not scoring the goals at centre forward for Man United. The only other option you've got a centre forward really is Callum Wilson, and he's a. Uh, I like Callum Wilson. I think he's a good player, but he's not started the season as well as Barnes. He's a different kind of player to to Kane as well. But Barnes gives you something different, and sometimes I feel like Southgate is a bit too wedded to his to his philosophies and and this kind of playing from the back, and he'll put players 
in you know who don't necessarily suit it well as rich was saying as we as we're talking england are playing kosovo michael Keane's just passed the ball straight to kosovo and to, to put them in front straight away and you think it's brilliant playing now from the back if you've got a midfielder who can come and take it off your center half toe similar thing to what i was saying with ben me but if you if you're giving balls to your center and putting them under pressure and they can't play it Maybe it's better to look at a different system, and maybe if we're one 0 down with ten minutes to go, you know, in in a, a qualifying game or or even in a finals game, you your better option to bring on from the bench rather than Callum Wilson and uh, you know who's not gonna who's not gonna win headers and and things like that. Maybe maybe it's an option to go a bit more direct and and throw Barnes into the mix and put him up with Kane and let him do the same job he does for Wood, which is doing his work for him, doing his running, beating up the defenders. So Kane's got the space. Um, but I think Southgate perhaps a bit too wedded to the way he wants to play, and yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not knocking it. We've done well under him, but it's, sometimes I think he's a bit too uh, philosophy driven and perhaps not pragmatic enough. Yeah, some interesting stuff in there, um, Richard. On the other end of the park, a lot of people were also very ex- very surprised at the exclusion of Tarkovsky, and um, especially with Tyrone Mings being brought into the squad, who's played what. Three, three or four Premier League games. Now, Tarkovsky has been playing at Premier League level for what, four seasons now, very, very competently. Um, I was quite surprised to see him drop, truly. I didn't really understand why. Going back to your first point about Tyrone Mings, that's one inclusion I really don't understand. And there's a lot of people at Verbian clubs who really don't get it. Obviously, he went on loan to Aston Villa last season in the Championship. He did well, there's no denying that. But there's a reason Bournemouth got rid of him. Obviously, they didn't think he was good enough for this level. And yeah, he started okay for Villa, but you know, for him to warrant an England call up after four games, and Villa's conceded a you know a few goals. It's not like they've kept a clean sheet every game. I just thought it was strange, and I think Tarkovsky started really, really well for us. He looks as good as he's ever been. He looks fit to me. He looks sharp. He looks hungry. And I'd, say, I'd even say against Liverpool, he was our standout player. Against Wolves, he was outstanding, and he's not put a foot wrong this season. So. I don't understand why when Southgate seen him as a potential option, um, you know, and then he drops him. And what Tom was saying there about, you know, Southgate does have a philosophy and actually respect him for that, for keeping a philosophy instead of chopping and changing all the time. So I don't get why you wouldn't keep Tarkovsky in somebody who is good on the ball, that he can genuinely play on the ball, um, but, he, but he can defend as well. So with a, with a Barnes omission, I understand that far more than the Tarkovsky one, which I, which I do find strange especially calling Mings up um, instead of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, Tom, I guess the last one uh, from an England perspective was that Nick Pope did get his, his call up again, which was expected and, and uh, delighted for him, obviously. Um, there's always going to be a nervousness when you've been out for so long that you have to maybe fight your way back in. But he did join Pickford and Tom also got called up. Um, for me, I think Nick Pope is massively banging on the door to be England number one and to be first choice Pickford I can't remember the last time he played well for Everton or for England um, do you think that Southgate's got him in to drop Pickford and maybe give Pope a go uh, to be fair I think Pickford has played well for England when he's played uh, the last competitive game with Switzerland wasn't it in the uh, Nations League and he's saved a couple of penalties in the shootout and scored one himself uh, and the World Cup he was good as well um, so I think he's earned this year. I think again, it comes back to what I was saying about the philosophy as well. Um, he's much better with his feet than Pope is. Uh, I mean, it, it, me personally, I, I, I'd be picking based on who's the better keeper, and I agree with you. I think uh, I think Pope is a better goalkeeper in terms of shot stopping, handling crosses, that sort of thing, than Pickford. But I think there is something to be said for for what, like Rich said, is, is picking a system, sticking to it, and especially picking a number one and sticking to him. Uh, and uh, to be fair, he's up and down for Everton. He does make some gaffes sometimes. I personally prefer Pope, but I think the fact that Pope's kicking isn't great is going to count against him uh, if he wants to fit into this team. And uh, and like I say, I think to be fair to Pickford, since he's been given this year, I don't think he's let us down. So I think uh, Pope's going to is going to be relying on a big drop in form for Pickford to to be staking a claim for the number one spot. I think. Okay, that's fair enough. I think we might have to to, to agree to disagree on Pickford. I'm just not a fan at all. Um, But yeah, you're probably right. I think maybe he's been worse for... I guess maybe I'm being blinded by his performances for Everton more than England. So I suppose that's maybe a fair point. 
Um, okay, moving on uh, away from England call up, and we move into the issue of our midfield and two very contrasting stories to discuss this week. The first one was the very unexpected news that Stephen DeFore um, was basically released on the European deadline day. Uh, we weren't expecting that at all. I think we were all expecting him. We were being told by the club that he was fighting back up to fitness and he was trying to get his way back into the club and we would hopefully see him at some point this season and then out of the blue, after the Liverpool game, the news dropped that he was probably going to be released by Burnley. And then that was confirmed as he's signed for Antwerp. Uh, 31 years of age, free agent, gone. Um, this is your immediate reaction and your farewell messages to Stephen Defoe. <laughs> Hi, it's Liam here from the Clarets Trust. Well, what can I say about Stephen Defoe? Two things spring to mind. That goal against Bristol City, sensational. Standing ovation at Turf Moor, amazing. What a little dink above the keeper. And then that free kick at Old Trafford, absolutely amazing. He was taken to our hearts very quickly. Even his wife loved the fans. Stephen, you will be missed. I wish we'd have got a bit more service off you but good luck for the future. Hello everyone, George Poole here. Well, what can I say about Stephen Defoe? He's the best player I've ever seen play for Burnley. And that's by a country mile, I think, as a technical player. He's provided some amazing moments. And away from all the, the three amazing goals he scored, the first half of the season he played when we uh, finished seventh. He was probably one of our best players. And... The points we got in that first half of the season carried us over the line to finish seventh in the end and gave us all those amazing European trips. That goal against Manchester United, I'll never forget. I was in the away end and as soon as he put the ball down on the spot and it 30 yards out, you, f you think there's no chance he's going to score this. I was with my dad and my dad just turned to me and said, oh, this is going in. I said, uh, yeah, all right. And then the rest of the say is history. To beat David De Gea from that distance, it's just absolutely incredible. What a goal. The, the celebration of that goal in the away end was some of the messiest limbs I've ever seen in my life. Absolutely incredible. And what a night that was at Old Trafford. Against the club that he almost signed for before he had that horrific injury so long ago. And it is a career at Burnley blighted by injuries. But that hasn't stopped his quality showing through. And I think that's probably the, going to be the lasting memory of Defoe. It's not going to be, oh, he didn't play much. It's just that he is probably the best player that my generation has ever seen pull on the sh Claret and Blue shirt. Uh, a class act. And his interview with Claret's play is well worth a watch if you haven't seen it already. You can tell he really does love the club. And it's such a shame that we didn't get to see more of him. But thank you very much for everything, Stephen, and good luck in your future career. The best to ever pull on the shirt in my lifetime. So, Richard, what um, you have quite a funny story about Defoe before we move on to, to reaction to him leaving. Um, you, you spoke to him recently. Do you want to tell us all about your... Um, uh, well, you just tell us your story, Richard. Uh, so, yeah, so it is a funny story. So very occasionally I do these sports tours on a weekend uh, where teams come from very diff various different places and we take them to a, a Premier League game and the, and the game that happened to be on the tour was the Burnley-Liverpool one. Obviously because we're taking young kids, we sit in a safe area which is the family section so you know players who aren't playing or families they sit there and then before the game I see Defoe and I thought right, this is my one chance to have a bit of a a bit of a love with him because uh, you know he's you know everyone everyone knows his quality. So I just went up to him and just said, you know, thanks Stephen, uh, you know, a great player, the best player I've seen in my time at Burnley. Uh, you know, when you when you're gonna be, you know, back playing for us and hand on our hand on, you know, my mum's life, my girlfriend's life, he said to me that he was going to be back in training with Burnley on the Monday. And then when I was looking on my phone that evening it said that uh, he's, he was having his contract terminated. So uh, Stephen told a little porky to me that I wasn't, you know, wasn't too pleased with him. 
<laughs> that is a hilarious story. When you told me that before we started recording this week, I was just absolutely crying with laughter that he just blatantly lied. Just no shame. Just lied to your face like, yeah, mate, thanks very much. I'll take the glory, but I'm out of here. Um, Tom, it came at a, as a bit of a surprise to us that he was going, but I, I feel really down about the whole DeFore situation. He's probably one of the best midfielders, if not the best midfielder I've ever seen at Turf Moor. And it felt like an opportunity that was lost, really, in that through nobody's fault, I would add, we never really got to see the, the full potential and see him as much as we wanted to. Yeah, such a massive shame. I'd concur with Rich. I think he's the best player we've had while I've been watching. Uh, really really it's just such a good footballer so talented so skillful uh that that 17 18 season the first half of it probably the best football best team with uh people of my age have, have seen and he was the hobby of it you know uh just what i was saying earlier about someone to come and set the ball off ben Mee's toes he was everywhere in that much field he'd come deep he'd spray it about one of those kind of players he never gives the ball away he always does something useful with it scored a couple of cracking goals for us as well um but I think as as I absolutely good to see him go and it's such a shame that it didn't really work out as it could have. You know, it's a shame that we didn't get to see him on the pitch more. But I think what you have to remember is uh probably if he didn't have that kind of an injury record, if he if he was kind of fitter, we would never have seen him play for us. He would have been playing for a, probably a top six team. Uh, I think he was that good. I think there's there's that story about um Man United were going to sign him before he had his first major injury that, and he's obviously kind of never recovered from that. But I think probably had he not had those injuries, although we we didn't get to see him as much as we would have liked in a Burnley shirt, we probably would have never got the chance to see him at all in a Burnley shirt. So, uh, bittersweet, I suppose. Yeah, it was. But well, obviously it goes without saying that we do all wish him the best of luck and it is a real shame. But I think his circumstances and his injuries and essentially some of the things he's had to deal with off the pitch as well, it's going to be much better for him as a person to just be able to get home, um, be with his family and, and start the end of his career um, back at home where he wants to. So best of luck for all of us. And I'm going to leave this section with um, a quick tweet from Anti Football, who sent us this message of thanks to Stephen. All the best and thanks to the lad before. Oh, actually, do you know what? This is hilarious. Oh my God, right. <laughs> I'm not even going to edit this because this is a hilarious comedy moment. I just pulled a tweet off from it. Somebody had tweeted us to say, and I thought this was a really nice message to say um, bye to Stephen DeFore. And I had to stop mid sentence because it actually says, all the best and thanks to the lad DeFore, but for me, we're better off shut of him with his superior quality, grace and composure on the ball. He changed our game and if we weren't careful, we might have ended up playing something on the turf and we just can't be having that now, can we? I think that that's a joke. <laughs> and I'm going to leave this in because I've just been stitched up hilariously by one of our listeners. So I'm going to get you back for that. That's going to the retribution bank. So moving swiftly on, um, Richard. The opposite end of the scale, some very disappointing news from our midfield cover, our loan signing, Danny Drinkwater, who came in um, in the summer transfer window until Christmas. And we were all incredibly excited to see such quality and come and essentially rejuvenise our central midfield. And we have now been hit with the news that he was injured in an off the field freak injury which got everybody's ears up a little bit, thinking what's going on, and the news being that he was going to be out for up to six weeks. It has now transpired that um, he, the team were given the weekend off by Deitch because the international break to rest, and they were allowed some down, downtime and drink water quite rightly within all the bounds of, of what he was allowed to do. Spent that Saturday night in Manchester in one of the bars and in a drunken state got into an argument with another player from another club um, over an alleged attempt to steal his girlfriend. This is all speculation. This is the reports we're hearing. Um, they were both evicted from the club by bouncers and once outside, Drinkwater was attacked by a gang of six men who uh, beat him up quite badly and we are told that allegedly they knew that he was a Premier League footballer and were stamping on his legs trying to break his legs and they were shouting break his legs break his legs and as a result he has suffered um, a black eye 
a swollen forehead, a cut cheek, bruises on his shoulders and his arms, but more importantly, torn ankle ligaments. Richard, where on earth do we start with that? Yeah, I just think it's just a real disappointing one. When we signed him, I thought, you know, what a great signing. It's a show of intent. We've got a player of real proven quality who would genuinely improve our team. And even though we didn't play too well against Sunderland, I think in the first half, he showed real glimpses of the quality he possesses. And, and you're just hoping, get away in this international break, get, your, get yourself fit. And what a great opportunity it is uh, to put your career back on track. Obviously, he's had trouble in the past with drink driving. He's he's been banned um, while he was, whilst he was playing at Chelsea, and yeah, obviously gone out in Manchester again. Like you said, I don't think there's anything wrong with players going out um, and socialising. You know, they're not robots, but at the same time, you've got to be professional and you know and know your limits. And yeah, it's just a really really disappointing story. It sounds like he was the agonist of the of the situation by trying to. Uh, Chat, chat, chat up another player's girlfriend, and obviously from there, yeah, it's it just it's just escalated, and he's got horrible injuries. And um, I bet he wasn't looking forward to the meeting with Mister Dyche uh, on Monday morning. So it'd be interesting to see uh, what what comes out of that. Yeah, definitely. Well, Tom, we're told that he did meet with Dyche on Monday morning and did explain to himself. His agent has come out and said that. Um, he fully accepts that he put himself in a very vulnerable position and he just simply cannot be in that situation. Takes full responsibility, is going to explain himself to the manager and basically take the consequences of what he did. So there's, there's definitely some um, humility in his response. Now, this is, this has elicited a, a lot of debate on social media with half the camp, well, everybody's annoyed at him and, and is very disappointed with him putting himself in this position. Um, but on one camp, people are saying, well, send him back to Chelsea, never going to see him play for Burnley or Darch himself will send him back. Whereas the other half are a little bit more sympathetic to his situation. We're told that Burnley are just... Well, Chelsea have not given him disciplinary action. They've called him to see how he is. And they've said that they will leave matters of discipline up to Burnley. Um, and we are told that... Dyche now has to decide whether to fine him or not. There's certainly no suggestion that he gets sent back to Chelsea. Um, what are your views on this? How does he redeem himself from this? And what does what does Dyche do if you're in his position? I think in terms of whether or not to keep him, uh, to me, it, it depends on how the deal's structured. Um, so we've got him on loan, as I understand it, until January at the minute. Uh, now, sometimes that's just because that's all you can get over the line at the time. And there's already an agreement in place to do something in the transfer window. I think when we signed Michael Keane, we got him on loan initially, but that was just because we didn't have enough time to get the deal done. And then in January, we, we spent some money and, and, and he was our player permanently. So I don't know if there's plans to do similar with Drinkwater if, if the agreement's all in place to to either buy him or to extend the loan in uh, in January. But if that agreement's not there, it's, it's hard to see why you would keep him for me. Um, he's played one game. Uh, he's gave away a goal in a 3-1 defeat at home to a League One team. Uh, and then the problems is fitness. I mean, I'm not against him going out and having a drink on Saturday night. Um, but if the problems is fitness, then is it the best idea? Um, he's obviously not someone who handles his alcohol particularly well based on past, discre- uh, past incidents, you know. Um, so for me, I mean... It, We've got him on loan. He's played one game. He's not played very well in that game. He's out now for another six weeks because of what he's got himself involved in. By the time he's back fit, it's we're going to be looking at, what, November now? Um, if the team's still playing well in November, is Dyche going to drop Cork or Westwood for him? Well, he, he doesn't drop players when they're not playing well, so the likelihood that he, he does that, unless they're really out of form, is is pretty low, I would say. So if you come into January, you haven't got any agreement to keep him beyond January. He's hardly kicked a ball for you and he's got himself involved in this kind of thing. Why would you keep him on? That's the way I look at it. But if there's if there's some sort of agreement in place to say, you know, we are going to do something in January, uh, then I suppose that's a different matter. And then you'd have to look at, so we've invested X, Y, Z in you. Um, we're going to have to sort something out. But for me, I, I'm in the, the cut your losses camp at the minute. I don't really see what he's providing. 
Wow, I didn't expect you to go down that path, Tom. That's good stuff. I was like, remind me never to get on the bad side of Tom Whitaker. <laughs> that was ruthless. Um, well, let's keep an eye on this one and see where it goes because um, we're still waiting to hear and it's going to be a couple of days before we get Deitch's official response. Um, I fully expect him to come. Well, actually, do I expect him to come out and basically shout at him in public? It's not really Deitch's style, is it? He's very, he does wrap cotton wool around his players and he does protect them, but this is a very different situation. So we'll see how that one goes. Um, that's all we've got time for this week. We uh, will be back next Tuesday um, looking at the reaction to the Brighton game um, in full and looking ahead to Norwich at home. Yes, Norwich at home. I had to check my notes and I didn't know the fixtures off the top of my head. Um, but later on this week, do not miss the Friday preview show, which will be back with myself and Statman Dave, Dave Roberts, where we will give you all the head-to-head -head and the fascinating facts on Brighton away. Um, my thanks, as ever this week, go to Richard and Tom for joining me in the studio and debating all these hot topics of the week, especially when we're on an international break. Guys, that's very much appreciated. Um, to producer Matt for editing and uh, making us all sound nice and slick and getting rid of all the errors. Thanks, Matt. Um, but thanks, as ever, go to you, the listener, for downloading and listening to this podcast. Your support is very much appreciated and we would not be here without you. I've been Natalie Bromley. This has been the Non and Never podcast. Until next time.